Welcome to episode 10 from the desk of Low. I have with me someone who I wanted to be the first guest since I started doing guest. Someone who's in my top five with an incredible flow to hip hop. I want to welcome another legend, Ken Crooked. Yo, what up, what up, what up? How you doing, sir? I'm doing excellent, man. How about yourself? I'm doing well, sir. I'm feeling very blessed. How's the weather in California? It's great in where I'm at. Uh, okay, yeah, it's cool, man. I'm outside in my backyard right now. It's cool if you've been, man. It's, uh, it's a little cool breeze outside. It's a little warm, but the breeze makes it all good. Ah, uh, Crook always smoking. Would you? Hey, that's uh, actually uh, one of my questions later on, but let's not jump into that. Um, so, I noticed that you're a voice for a lot of unsigned rappers and upcoming artists on your Instagram. Is is there a story behind that? Um, basically, man, I just want to share my platform. You know what I'm saying? With uh, with up and coming artists, it's just something that I always wanted to do, and you know, just to give back to the community, the hip hop community. And you never know, somebody might, you know, who follows me might see an artist and like them and it might create an opportunity for that artist, you know what I mean? So you just never know, or they might get a new fan or whatever. So I just like to share my platform with other coming artists because I know how it is when you're on the come up. Sometimes you feel like nobody's listening, nobody's watching, nobody's paying attention to you. So, you know, now that I got somewhat of a cool platform, I just like to share it with the uh with the community, you know what I mean? Is is it um, it, it, was that like one of your main goals always, or is that one of your main goals when you became sober? Um, it's always been my goal, man. You know, I was always fan friendly, and and once and once I became, you know, what I'm saying like um a, a, a tourer, like going on a lot of tours, um. I would always talk to a lot of the fans and the supporters of the music, and then you find out that they make music themselves. So it's like, you know what? I need to figure out how to help some of these people because, um, you know, I'm in Cali, man. You got Hollywood down the street. You got all these record labels. You got so many opportunities, so many different entities that can help your career. But some people might be in small cities and they don't have any industry. They don't have, you know... Capitol Records down the street. They don't have Universal Music Group and Interscope down the street. So they try to figure out, well, how do I get seen? How do I get opportunity to be heard? So I figured that, you know, I would do something to try to uh, give back and create platforms. It's one of the reasons why I did the show One Shot on BET. As a matter of fact, it's the main reason I did the show One Shot on BET. You know, I wasn't sober then. You know what I'm saying? But it was still my focus to, um, you know, help pay it forward and just help artists get eyeballs, man. That's all they need. They need ears and eyeballs. And, you know, they might get an opportunity out of that. It's like what you said in one of your posts. You never know who's watching, who wants to give you an opportunity, but they checking you out. Mm-hmm. You never know. You know what I'm saying? You know, I got plenty of stories about, you know, big-time executives watching me when I didn't know they were watching, listening, when I didn't know they were listening, you know? So I don't want any artists, if you're an upcoming artist and you're listening to to me and my guy right now have this conversation, don't ever think that the whole industry is ignoring you. Somebody's listening. Somebody's watching. And I hope somebody hears that and runs with it because there's a lot of posts that you said and I ran with it. I hope so, man. Hey. I really hope so. I just want to motivate people, but what's up? Oh, no. Uh, what are you saying about motivating people? Sorry to cut you off. No, I just want to motivate people. I think that, I think once you achieve certain goals in life, you know what I'm saying, and you get to a certain level of respect and so-called status, I think you got to start learning to speak the language of inspiration. You got to start putting it in your daily thoughts that, hey, I want to motivate other people. Because, you know, some people look at me and they say, man, I wish I could be on the cover of XXL or I wish I could be, you know, touring across the world and, you know, living my life and, you know, doing my what I love to do. And so I got to say, hey, you know what? You can do it, <laughs> you know? And sometimes it just 
it just takes the right types of communication, you know. So I just always want to make sure that I'm speaking the language of motivation because I want to motivate people to, to to realize their goals. Do you think Pac would have been like that if he was still here? Absolutely. I, I have no doubt in my mind. I think that Tupac was definitely on that on that um, pathway. You know, he wanted to start Machiavelli Records, sign other artists. He already went very, very hard for the outlaws and thug life. You know, he took care of his crew. So, you know, he would take care of, you know, other artists if they came through. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think he would definitely been on that path. That's what you do with the horseshoe game. I see that. I see you guys working. Yeah, got to, man. Still waiting on title. Still waiting on title for that Horseshoe album, but hey, if it's worth the wait, since you guys got to get the cracked album, I'm willing to wait. That's what's up. I, pr- I appreciate that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, like being being a leader means that, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, and, you know, that was that was my mistake. You know what I mean? So I had to make sure that I, I said it publicly. You know what I mean? So people will understand that. That leadership ain't about hiding behind other people or passing the buck. Or trying to, you know what I mean, sweep things under the rug. No, I just get right in front of the camera and let people know. That's my bad. I apologize. But at you least, know what I'm saying? but at least you're real with it. That's that's hard to find nowadays. Man, I, I'm glad you said that, man, because it, it is, man. It's like a needle in a haystack, bro. Especially in the rap industry. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? Some people even some people even know how to fake like they're real for a minute, and then you find out, oh, this person is fake. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, let's keep it real out here. Oh, yeah, 100 for sure. That's all we do. 100. I got to keep it 100 or 1,000 at any time of my life. Um, exactly. So, one of your Instagram posts that I, I mean, one of your Instagram questions I've seen you post is like, ask me a question. And I said, why are you so real? And you took it as a compliment. It's like, do, do you really take that as a compliment? Because, like, like being real is hard. Mr. Wycliffe, it's 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 hard because I deal with a lot of fake people, and like I don't know why people are fake when they just can't be straight up and tell you the truth. I I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's not that hard, but you know, I do take that as a compliment because you know you got a lot of things out here that you could take as a compliment. You know what I mean? Or you know, certain certain artists they might be looking for certain type of accolades and props. You know what I'm saying? Like. But if you get a Grammy nomination, that's beautiful because what that's going to do is it's going to bring more attention to your brand and people are going to, you know, check for you more. You know what I'm saying? And that's all cool. But you know what? Just What's just as dope as that is if somebody says, hey, man, you're real. You know what I mean? It's, it's just as dope. So, you know, I just, I just try to, man... I, I don't know, man. It's, it seems like sometimes the real is just not in style. It seems like being real is just not trendy. You know what I mean? But I just don't want to ever not be real. Man, I can't wait till real starts being trendy again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Hey, um, I heard you're well, very well versed in hip hop, as you should be. Um, can you remember the very first song or album that you ever heard? I'm born in 91, so I can't imagine be, being music so accessible as it is nowadays. Yeah, it wasn't, man, but my mom, my mom played a lot of music around the house, and she had some old records, you know what I mean, that we used to dig through, you know, me and my brothers. And uh, one of them was Rapper's Delight. Oh, okay. Hill Gang. You know what I mean? And we put that on and said, let me hear this, man. And it's like, we start dying laughing when the rapper starts talking about, you know, have you ever went over at your friend's house to eat and the food is just no good? And he starts talking about how the chicken tastes like wood. So that was always funny to us. You know, we're like, this is funny, you know what I mean? And eventually I learned the whole the whole rap. And I told her I did it for my mom. You know what I'm saying? And she was like, wow, that's crazy. So she put me in a talent show. You know what I'm saying? And then I started rapping in talent shows. So, you know, it was it was her 
support of my passion in the beginning stages, you know what I mean, that made me feel like maybe this is something that I could do, you know, in real life. And the first record to get back to your question was Rapper's Delight, which is one of the first breakout hits I learned when I grew up, that that was one of the first major rap hits ever. Oh. See, see, yeah, like, I'm, like, I'm born in 91, so, like, I have to go back and do my research, like, a, a lot of, as a lot of kids should nowadays, which they don't, but, like, when I found Sugar Hill Gang, I was probably, I think it was in the winter of 2002, when I was going through my West Coast phase. Mm. But, like mm. I said, I jump from, yeah. I jump from phases from, like, West Coast phases to East Coast phases, it just depends on who comes along. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. Nah, you, hey, I, I give you respect for doing that. I give you respect for going back, you know what I'm saying, and, 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 and doing your research. Hats off to you. Hey, I always take you in a Twitter and saying, like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And I don't know if you know that's me or not. Hello? Hello? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I guess the connection must have cut off. Yeah, it's all good. I'm here. What's uh, up? Oh, I was going to say, uh, I noticed you smoke cigars, too. Uh, I, w- I want to ask you, for someone who never smoked cigars in his life, but was always curious, what kind of cigars do you recommend, Crook? No prime times, please. Uh, if you ain't never smoked a cigar, you want to smoke one? Um, Something that has flavor. Romeo and Juliet, man. You know, get you a Romeo and Juliet, or you can get a uh, a Rocky Patel, or you can get a um, um, Cohiba. But me personally, I like the Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. I'm gonna go check that out in the Shikari shop as a celebration for this week. Mm, go do it, man. Get you a Romeo and Juliet. Light it up. Make sure that it's fresh. Let, don't let them sell you a stale one. You know what I'm saying? And uh, light it up, man. It's, it's just, you're going to be very relaxed and chilling. I'll, I'll probably die the first couple puffs until I get used to it, but I'll probably be chilling after that. <laughs> but wait a minute, do you smoke weed? Oh, oh, yes. Okay, so just don't smoke it like you smoke weed. Don't inhale the smoke in through your lungs and hold it in your lungs, because then you're right. You just going to cave in your chest, and we don't want that. You know what I mean? So... Just smoke it, kind of treat it like you're sipping out of a straw. You know what I mean? Okay. And just blow it out. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't even, like, you might taste the smoke in your mouth for a little while. Just blow it out. Don't let it get inside your lungs and all that. Too many people smoke cigars like they're smoking weed, and then they wonder why they're having an asthma attack. You feel me? Yeah. I don't want that. I want to enjoy the smoke. Exactly. Hey, um... I noticed that you've been like on a like a lot of like uh, consciousness lately, and like uh, I, this is a question I always wanted to ask you: is like, how do you deal with racism? Because I'm Native American, and I've and I've dealt and seen racism with my life and my people's life for most of my life, and I'm just wondering on how you deal with something like that. I mean, you know, just like you do, man. You know, we it's it's first of all. We acknowledge that it that it exists, because you got some people who deny. They don't even think is they don't think racism exists, and that's crazy to me. Because the world, you know, the internet is so much access to everything. You can see it right in front of your face. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So first, 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 we have to understand that it really exists, and then we have to understand well, what levels does racism exist? You know what I mean? And then you start thinking about it's a systematic thing, you know, because people often mistake prejudice for racism, you know, and it's two different things. Like me and you, you're a Native American, right? Yeah. So me and you, we can call people mean names. We can say we we could do, we could insult them. We could do all this stuff. We could be prejudiced towards somebody, toward a group of people. But we can never be racist. You know why? Because racism, it requires a system behind it. 
It requires institutions. It's systemic. That's why they call it systemic racism. It requires power behind it. In this country, my people don't have enough power to be systemically racist toward people. We don't control the institutions of law, of education, the taxes. We don't control any of that. So we, we don't have the power to be on the level that, you know what I'm saying, the European has the power to be on in America. So it's just a lot of layers you got to understand when it comes to racism. And we got to understand the real definition of it. And then we got to understand how powerful it is. Because if we don't understand it, we can't fight it. You know what I'm saying? And we all got to get on one page because its ultimate job is to, to divide people. And that's why I love hip hop because hip hop brings everybody together white, black, native, you know, Hispanic, Asian, Samoan. Hip hop brings everybody together. You know what I'm saying? It's a, uni- it's a key of unification, it's a unification tool. So, you know, that's why I love hip hop. But when it comes to racism, its job is to divide and to make some people feel more superior to, than to others. So, you know, we just got to address it. We can't hold our tongues about it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to hold my tongue about some something that's being said that's racist or somebody being discriminated against or some unarmed black kid getting shot down by a white police officer. I'm not afraid to speak on that because it's the truth, it's real, and these things need to change. Now, other artists... They don't want to because, hey, I don't want to get into politics. It's not my brand. I might lose some of my um, endorsement deals. I might lose some of my big movie soundtracks that I'm coming out on. You know, So they don't say nothing. They just in it for the money. That's fine. But you got to move out the way for the real people to come to the front. You know what I'm saying? You got to move because hip-hop has always been about education and has always been about unification, but it's been about the truth. We got to spread the truth with truth tellers. That's very true. That's very true. Like, it, and look at the church right now. It's all hip hop. And, and it's, it's nuts how racism in 2018 is repeating itself. It still blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, it's because the powers that be wanted to, they, they don't want to remove that element. Because that element is, 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 is keeping them in power. If, you know, when you say white supremacy, you're not just talking about all white people who are prejudiced. You're talking about an elite amount, uh, an elite group of white people who have certain power, and that power will brainwash its own. They'll brainwash their own people and say, yo, don't fuck with them black people right there, you know, and give them a million reasons and propaganda and lies. And they'll go out and they'll believe it. And they don't even understand that those powerful one percenters don't give a fuck about poor whites. Just like they don't give a fuck about poor Mexicans and poor blacks. But the white supremacy law is we have to divide and conquer. See what I'm saying? And then it gets even deeper than that because you got black white supremacists like Ben Carson. And nobody talks about the black white supremacists. So it's just real deep, man. That's why I did Good versus Evil. I was going to say, uh, is, for the inspiration for that, like, like, because I noticed, like, for your artwork and your single cover, like, it's very, like, an anime style of, like, like of, um, like of artwork. Was that something, like, you seen in anime and it kind of, like, said, I want to do that for the artwork? I mean, the artwork, you know what I'm saying? I, I watch anime, you know, since I was a kid. I started watching Ninja Scroll. Oh, I love that. Um, Classic. You know you know what I'm saying? So ever since then, I was into it. Because here it is, some animation. But, you know, they're, they're not holding back. It's like watching, back when I was young, you had to watch HBO and stuff like that to see uncut movies. Oh, it was never like are you animation. T- so now it's like with the anime, they're just so real. You know what I'm saying? It's so close to life. 
and they don't have any boundaries when they draw, and that's how I am when I create. I don't, I don't like to have a lot of boundaries. That's one thing that I hate having in the process of creation, a boundary. Don't say this. Don't do that. Don't, no, nah, man. Let me create. Let me let me put this art together the way, you know, I want to put it together. So that's what they do in anime. I love it. They, the imagination is crazy. So when I did the Good versus Evil, the first one kind of looked a little bit like the X-Men cartoon back in the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the cover... But the cover art for uh, Shoot Back, uh, that that that's like some kind of Dragon Ball Z, like Robocop anime thing right there. Like I was like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a, you got it. I knew, I knew, just by your style of art, I knew you watch anime. I just, I had to know from the goat's mouth itself. Oh yeah, you know that dog. I watch it all. You know what I'm saying. Um, I'm waiting on season two of One Punch Man to come back. You know. Oh. Um, I watch everything, man. I watch it all, like, from, you know, Full Metal Alchemist. One Piece? Uh, One Piece, Naruto. You know, I really like how they set that whole dynamic up with the Hidden Leaf Village and, you know, these different um, groups of people that, you know what I mean? It's kind of like the Game of Thrones, really. You know what I'm saying? If you think about it. Everybody had their own village and rulers and leaders, and they would go to war with each other. Um... What about Oz? Yeah, just, sorry to cut. Sorry to change the subject so fast. You said Oz? Yeah, like how real is that? I own all the seasons of that. How how real is that show? You talk about Oz back in the day when it was in the, in the jail system. Yeah, like the HBO Oz. Oh yeah, Oz. Yeah, Oz was crazy. Was and like that kid on there at a BC. He was he was, he was nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they they did a good job. They kept it raw on there, man. It's, it's funny because um, Lord Jamar was on that on that show, man, and now he's like this big figure on the Vlad TV circuit. But to, if to you be, go back to Oz, he was a character on that. To be honest, that's how he found who Lord Jamar was because of Oz, and then years later, I seen him on Lord Jam- uh, I mean on Vlad TV, and I was like, wait, that's, that's the guy from mm-hmm. Oz. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's um. There's a lot of things like people will want to ask you, and like I, I noticed that. Do you think like getting help from a therapist is really worth it if you have trust issues? It's very hard, bro. You know, uh, I got a line in "Sober Up." You know, the song I got with Joe Budden called "Sober Up," um, where I say, uh, "How can therapy take care of me?" I don't give a fuck what niggas think. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if I don't care what this man's thoughts are about me, how is he going to help me? Because any diagnosis, any advice, any suggestion, I don't care about. You know what I mean? So I think therapy helps people that are in a certain space. I think you have to be in a space, a mental space, to receive this and say, yo, I'm going to be very open, listen and see if this person can help me. I'm going to let this person in. And I think you have to be in that space. If you're not in that space, and it's cool to not be in that space because sometimes it takes a while for us to, you know, find out how we want to rock out. So maybe we don't want to be in that space right now. But if you want to seek therapy, my advice would be to be very open. And you know what I'm saying? And you got to understand, you got to let that person in. First time, first time they do something to violate your trust, cut them off. Close the door on them. Get out of there. Get another therapist. You know what I'm saying? But I think communication on a whole is something that could be, you know, medication type. You know what I mean? Like, so I think the, the, the when you break it all down, what it really is is communication. I don't think it's some master degree some piece of paper hanging in a wall or in a frame. I think therapy comes in many forms, but one of its main forms is communication. And that's why the lady does Oprah's friend, Ayala, has a therapy show, and she's not a professional therapist. She's not. She doesn't have a degree in that area. 
but it works for her because she understands how to communicate. And at the end of the day, I think that's what, that's the most therapeutic thing. It's just the ability to be able to communicate and listen to people and offer sound advice. Well, then you got music, which is also therapeutic too. And that's my most, that's been my therapy my whole life. If I didn't have music, I don't know where I'd be. Yeah, I feel you uh, on that, that's, Cook. Yeah, that's 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 been my medicine my whole life. You know what I'm saying? It's music. And and, and and having the ability to go and make some, you know. Um, but even if I wasn't making it, I would have to have it around me. You know what I mean? Every day I would have to have some type of music. That's my medicine. Hey, um, speaking of music, like, because you use it as medicine, do you ever, like, listen to unreleased music that the world wait will never get to hear and you play it at just for yourself and you just, like, you just use it as ther- therapeutic? Well, I, I get to hear a lot of unreleased music. You know, I have unreleased Eminem music. I have unreleased Slaughterhouse music. I have unreleased music of my own. I have unreleased Horseshoe Gang music. I got tons of unreleased music. And it's always cool to go back and listen to some of that stuff and wonder what people would think if they ever heard it, you know? And just to know that maybe one day it'll come out, maybe it won't. But, you know, it feels like you have a treasure chest full of jewels, you know what I mean? And it's a, it's a good feeling to go and listen to stuff like that, you know? Sometimes I share it. Like the other day on Instagram, a couple of weeks back, I shared an unreleased version of Phenomenal, Eminem's song. Because when M when M made Phenomenal, he sent it to me, and he was like, yo, I want to get you on this joint. And I was like, all right, cool. So I did a verse to it. You know what I'm saying? And then he ended up wanting to put it, I think, in the South Paw soundtrack. And he was like, well, I might just do a whole joint and then let Slaughterhouse do another joint in the soundtrack. So we ended up not using the version with me and him. And uh, Joel was on there too. You know what I mean? So I played it live on my Instagram the other day and people really loved it. It's like, man, did you remix it? Oh, it's not a remix. <laughs> this was the version before the one you heard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know that's on YouTube when you put that up? Somebody cut that and put it on YouTube? They put it on YouTube? Yeah, like, I'll, I'll send you a screenshot later, <laughs> but they dead ass like, put it on YouTube, like, 14 hours you posted that. It's like, Crooked Eye plays Unreleased Lost Phenomenon. I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I was like, the internet that has, like, no sleep at all. Yo, the internet is on it. They don't play. They've been waiting. Hey, I also seen that you're are you really coming out of a book? Yeah. Like. Yeah, man. Is it about? I'm writing. I'm writing it right now. It's about your career, not just your time on Slaughterhouse, right? Well, I'm gonna. Uh, well, this is my in my mind. I want to do several books. Okay. I want to do one book. You know what I'm saying about my time at Death Row. I want to do a book. You know about Slaughterhouse, and then I want to do a book about you know just my life. And then I'll probably come out with, like, three books, you know what I mean? And that'll be my contribution as far as, you know, me writing and being an author, you know, unless something else inspires me. But that right off, those are the things I want to write about. So I started the Slaughterhouse book. You know, when I get free time, I, you know, I add to it. I'm about three chapters in right now. Um you know, I'm taking my time with it. You know what I'm saying? I got a lot of other things going on, but I'm definitely putting out putting out a book. Definitely putting out a book. I have to. It's a crazy story that needs to be it needs it needs to live on. You know what I'm saying? In a diff, in a different form. Not just not just on the music or streams or C D or or interview. Or no yeah, light, or no DVD things. like Life After Death Row. Like you want like something that tells it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that, something that you can hold in your hand, and you can say, "Look, here's here's the story about four guys who came together, formed a super group, and this is what was great about it, and this is what wasn't so great about it." 
I was going to say I got that album signed by Royce. There you go. <laughs> but, like, that's what I mean. I don't get to see a lot of things in music. And when I, like, I seen Slaughterhouse Forum on the internet with whack MCs. Like, that's what I, I, I seen that from. Well, I followed your career long before that. But just to see a super group forum like that, like, you know what a horseman, obviously, right? Yeah, the horseman, yeah. Yeah. The horseman. Like, you. Cannabis corrupt. Yeah. And Raz Kiaz and Killer Priest. Like, Raz Kiaz, Killer Priest, yeah. And you got to see that form, I'm guessing. Yeah, man. I mean, they were supposed to drop an album. They never really dropped an album. You know, because it's tough. You got four solo artists, four attitudes, four different opinions, you know, four people going in different directions in their careers hard. You know, we just managed to bring it all together and at least do, you know, a few mixtapes, a few albums, man. We, we we put some nice little projects together, you know? Some of the best out there. Some of the best. Yes, sir. But um, I noticed that, like, you're very conscious, too, and, like, do you do you recommend, like, any books or documentaries for people my age to help spread the yeah, message man. you're trying to uh-huh. deliver? Um, it's a lot of books, man. You know, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Um, I like that book because it talks about the power of thought. You know what I mean? And a lot of young people need to understand how much power they hold in just their train of thought. You know, so Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Dennis P. Kimbrough, What Makes the Great Great. I like that book because this guy spent 20 years interviewing major CEOs and major success, successful uh, athletes and just successful people, period. All people that you've heard of before. He spent 20 years interviewing these people, trying to figure out what they all had in common. What makes these guys all great and these women? You know, so it's called What's, What Makes the Great Great. Um, Dennis P. Kimbrough. The Autobiography of Malcolm X is a great book. You know what I mean? It shows it tells the story of somebody, um, you know, coming from the streets and then having a light turned on in their head to make them understand that it's not all about them, you know, it's about the world. So, you know, the autobiography of Malcolm X is a good one. Um I think I'm gonna have to pick that I one up. I can go on and on, bro. I can go on and on. It's just there's a lot of good books out there. James Baldwin, he always dropping knowledge in his books. Um, you know, if you if you're in the business, you're an entrepreneur, you probably should read the uh, Third Circle Theory. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. If you're an entrepreneur, read the Third Circle Theory. If you're somebody who just wants to understand about how the universe moves and you know, um, you know, um, the law of attraction and things like that, you got the Secret, or you have the Alchemist. Alchemist was a great book. I mean, I read a lot of books. You see what I'm saying? I don't think I don't think you should go through this life without trying to learn and expand your mind daily. You know, you might not be a book, read an article. You, might, you see articles running up and down your timeline all day on Twitter. Click on one of them. That interests you. Read. Exercise the mind. Learn something. Take a note. Put it in your phone notes. Keep it there. You know what I mean? You might stumble across it later on and be like, yo, I'm glad I put this here because I was falling off. Now I'm back on because I just read this again. You know, I actually do put notes in my phone and look back on it. There you go. See what I mean? (laughs) it's It's crazy how that works. I actually got that book, The Secret, too. Yeah, The Secret was dope, man. You know what I'm saying? And some of those authors that came together to make that, they have their own books that are dope, too. You know what I mean? So this is a lot. You know, just read, man. You know, we got it. It's easy now. Get on your iPad. Sorry, what's that? digital thing and read. Hold on one sec. I got to plug my phone to her. Oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'm still here. My bad. My bad to the podcast. 
Hey, don't worry. Oh, they they understand. They understand. It's only it's only I should not small. It's okay. Yeah, man. Hey, I was gonna ask but, uh, you too. Um, what's up? How how did you stumble upon Anchor? Cause that's what I'm using. Uh, man, I just uh, how did I stumble upon Anchor? You know what, bro? I think I saw some kind of article. Nah, you know what it was? It was Gary V, bro. Oh, you know no. Gary V. Yeah, I follow him on the gram. Yeah, Gary V. He was like, yo, they got this new app, Anchor, where you could do a podcast. He was like, it's brand new, you know. It just started. So I was like, hmm, let me go over there and check out. You know what I'm saying? Let me check this out myself. You know what I mean? If Gary V on it, you know, let me get on it. I like Gary V. He's a, uh, he's an inspirational guy. You know what I'm saying? So I said, let me do it. And I checked it out. It was cool. So said, man, let me get some of these thoughts out. You know what I mean? Because... A lot of people ask me a lot of stuff, and I don't have a whole lot of time. So when I get my free time, it's like, man, let me, let me put some of these thoughts in the air. You know what I'm saying? So it was, it's fun, man. I, I plan on doing more a little bit later. I've just been working on adding more value to myself by, you know, um, learning a couple new skills that's going to help my bottom line. Hey, and that's all it takes. Like, you got to learn. you got to build yourself up before you can help others. You better believe it. That's right, sir. That's real. Hey, I got two more questions for you, sir, and then I'll let you go because right. I understand you're a very busy man. No doubt. Let's fire off, fire off. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with Poem City, what do you try to achieve with that, sir? Poem City, man. Like I said, the story behind Poem City real quick. I wrote a bunch of poems when I was in the first grade. My mom formed them into a book. She asked me, okay, so what do you want to call the book? I said, Poem City. And it was just a book of my first, my first book of poems that I ever wrote. So when I started co jumping into the media game, I didn't really have a company. You know what I mean? I did one shot for BET, and I have a host of other TV shows in my mind that I want to do and different types of media I want to be involved in. I need a company for it all. So I said, hey, let me call it Poem City and bring it all full circle just like when I was a kid, you know what I mean? I called my mom, I said, hey, guess what the name of my new company is? She said, what? I said, Poem City. She started laughing. I said, hey, it's full circle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's Poem City, man. We hope we hope to bring out new, you know, TV shows, documentaries, docuseries, um, different things of that nature, you know what I mean? That's what I'm, I've been working on a lot lately. I'll be on the lookout for that, sir. That sounds very interesting. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. You should share some of those poems. I'd like to see what you were writing some bars back in first grade. Man, you know what? I know uh, a lot of my, my poems when I was in the first grade was about riding the bus or riding the train. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we ride the train even when it rains. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Just that. But you know what? Those bars are might, might be better than some of these that's out now, you feel me? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I can name a few because I ain't going to interview them. It's way better than that 6 9 kid. Oh, God, I can't stand that shit. <laughs> Anybody who listens to 6 9 get off my podcast. Oh, man. We don't get down with... Gosh, we we appreciate <laughs> bars on this podcast. Hey. Hey. Yeah, just the bar program. <laughs> oh, I may call the episode that. <laughs> hey, good. hey, um, last question, sir, because this is something I ask all my guests. Any, any last words for someone in the dark place trying to see the light? You know what? That's a great question. Um, that's crazy, man. I gotta really sit and think on that. You know what I mean? Because take your time. It's a, it's a crazy world. You know, and sometimes it's a world of our own design. Sometimes the decisions we make, the moves we make, we put ourselves in a dark place sometimes. It's not always the world's fault. Sometimes it's our fault. And we just got to look within and ask ourselves, what could I do better that will make me feel better? What can I do to better myself? 
you know, and we got to understand that they say time heals wounds. There's a lot of truth in that. Some people, they say, nah, that's bullshit. I say, yo, there's a lot of truth in time healing wounds, but we got to be open and let, let time do its thing. You know what I mean? Like, I remember when my uncle first died of cancer, you know, he was my one and only father figure from my father's side of the family. You know, my father bounced out on me when I was young. I didn't really have no relationship with him. My uncle, he was always there for me. I said, hey, uh, I got a uh, meeting at a, at a record label, and he would give me the money to get a new outfit and go up there and play my demo for record execs. He was in my corner. When he passed, it hit me hard. I remember I couldn't even go past the hospital that he was that he died in. I watched him die in the bed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I used to go on different routes because I didn't even want to pass the building. And that's just one thing in my life that had me in a dark place before. But now I look at it from a different angle. He's no longer in pain. You know what I'm saying? The pain is gone. And his memory will always live. I put him in my verse on Goodbye on the Slaughterhouse song. It's forever now. People hit me up and say, yo, this is dope, man. It helps me when I'm thinking about my personal life or thing, people in my life that have passed away from cancer and what whatnot. So we just got to look within and try to view things from a different angle. And sometimes that different angle will show us there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes we got to get out of our own way. Because sometimes we're the one blocking the light, but we don't we don't understand that. We have to understand that we have to get out of our own way sometimes and let that light shine and communicate with one another. Like I always say, hit me on the DM if you're feeling like that. If I get time, I'll definitely hit you back. That's what I got to say to that. And with that being said, I hope somebody takes that and, and helps them one day. Because that's what the main reason I started this podcast was to help people. Word. But, that's what's up, bro. But, like I said, that's the end of episode 10. Like I said, this is somebody who I wanted since the beginning of the podcast. And it just shows you that if you chase your dreams, it comes true. And I'm out. One.